Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Thankful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. Thankful for the prayers of God's people, those that have been praying um, for this ministry and for this body of people. You know, the scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're to walk in truth. Sometimes the reality of things are not what we want them to be. Uh, when it comes to the things that all tie to the core of our belief and our hope, which is the resurrection from the dead and that Jesus is the first to rise from the dead never to die anymore, there are a lot of things that are central to the core that we have to examine and uh, we're told more than one time that our enemy is deceitful uh, that he's a liar and he's out to destroy God's people if he has an opportunity and along the way we need to seek truth you know there's a there's a saying that says a lot of people will tell you that they want truth but they often find it distasteful when it's served up um, Wayne and I have been having a discussion uh, in the past couple of months about how hard it is to unlearn the things that we've been taught during our childhood raising uh, Sonny Piles has a saying that says, never underestimate the power of a childhood raising. And we've been taught something all of our lives, and the first time that someone says anything contrary to it, well, it's negative, we react to it, uh, you know, we, we don't, we're comfortable in our ways. Uh, there are... I think two purposes of the gospel, and one is to comfort God's people, and another is to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Sometimes we get in a comfort zone, uh, we need to be stirred up. Uh, I, I have a desire to stir up God's people and to um, cause them to think on their own. Uh, I can't do your thinking for you. I can't do my thinking for my wife. My wife can't do my thinking. So sometimes now we do think alike. Being being married for so many years, and I can anticipate when she's getting ready to say something. I, and we do think alike. But we need to all get into the Word of God for ourselves. And I, I think that's one of the things that that is critical for me to do is to stir you up and and I could say Mary had a little I could get up here and say Mary had a little lamb fleece as white as snow and you, and you may oh I just love that or whatever but it doesn't stir you sometimes we may have to get on toes um, but you need to be stirred up you have two minds. You have a carnal mind and you have a spiritual mind. The carnal mind is very easily appealed to. And I think that by and large that's what we see a lot of what we call nominal Christianity. Uh, you can make an appeal to their carnal mind. And they will, uh, they will agree with it, with what you teach. But we want to make an appeal to the spiritual mind. 
there's a lot of things that have transpired in the past week as far as the things that I've been meditating about, things I've been studying. Um, one of the things that I want to do is ask you to first pray for me that God would give me grace and that uh, that I be able to preach Christ Jesus and Him crucified. Now I know it's all central. You know, Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that doesn't mean that every week that you come here that you're going to hear me teach about grace, 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 grace. There is much more to this book. There are a lot of things that are central to our daily, our daily lives and our walk that are tied to that core of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So, And as any farmer will tell you, when he's plowing a field, when he gets next to the fence, he has what's called a turn row. And when you get to the turn row, that means you turn around and come back. And sometimes I may get close to the fence, but I always want to come back to the core, to the, to the center, which is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So this morning I, I, want, to, I want to use a text that's found in John chapter 19, and it's one that we better, better know. <laughs> we, and I hope that we have a good understanding of it. And um, it's when Jesus was on the cross. There are seven sayings that the Lord had. I'm not going to go through all those. But we should know that the last thing that He said, He says, it's finished. It is finished. And he corroborates that, that very truth in John chapter 17 before he went to the cross. He says, I have finished the work which thou, hast give, that which thou gavest me to do. I have given eternal life to as many as thou hast given me. Jesus, the work of redemption uh, was completed on the cross. There's nothing left for anybody to do. Now, one of the reasons that I, that I want to take this particular text... Is it seems nowadays we have, by and large, we have a group of people that believe that it's not finished, and they further they believe that the Lord is coming back. Uh, he's going to set up a kingdom, and he's going to reinstitute the sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament. Uh, you've heard me say before that's the teaching of John Darby. Uh, we picked that up in about 1830 and it was amplified in the Schofield Bible around the early 1900s. Uh, and, and it ended up that the Schofield Bible went through a lot of seminaries and a lot of people came out believing that very thing. But here's the, here's the whole thing. Why I cannot support that idea. To reinstitute and start those sacrifices up is like saying, I do not believe that it's finished. Because... All those sacrifices and all those things in the law were outward types and shadows of that which is to come in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those, and Jesus Christ is the antitype, the antitype of all those types and shadows of the law that they pointed to the one ultimate one-time sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he, he caused the oblation and the sacrifice to cease. Now, even though the Jews continued to make those sacrifices, I believe that God ceased to recognize them because the one, the Lamb of God, he said, John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And I'm not going to labor about who the world is this morning. Old Baptists know what that means and who, who they are. It's the world of God's elect. But he took away the sin of his, uh, of his people. He took away the sins of the world. And for us to support the idea, some say, well, we need to support Israel. Well, I can't support the idea because it's their stated objective that just at the first uh, opportunity they have, they have a pre-staged temple that they're going to throw up and they have the ashes of the red heifer they claim to re restart these sacrifices. I can't support that. And I don't think that you should support it either because it's like saying, I don't believe that it's finished. 
Um, over in Romans chapter 11. Now, we have to, we have to come to an understanding. I, I think a few weeks ago, I very plainly showed you from the Scripture who the true Jews are. The true Jews are those that are circumcised in the heart. And Paul says that very plainly in the last two verses of the book of Romans. There's no mistaking that. He says, he is not a Jew, which is one which is outward. But the true Jew is the one that's circumcised of the heart. So, we need to understand that much. Now, concerning nat- natural Israel, or national Israel, here's what Paul said about it in, in Romans chapter 11. Or about them. He says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they're beloved for the Father's sake. Now, what is that saying? He says, we can't have fellowship with them because of the gospel forbids us. And I'm not trying to be... Some people are going to say, you're anti-Semitic, you're a Jew hater. That's no, absolutely not. The scripture tells us that we're not to have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And he says, and to mark those that cause division contrary to the doctrine you have learned and avoid them. We cannot, and, and it's very evident that national, because they haven't, uh, the national Israel, they haven't been converted and they are anti-Christ. Now that's, that's, not, that's a fact. Until they're, unless they're converted to Jesus Christ, they're anti, they're against Christ. And if you don't believe me, you can find a lot of evidence out there that proves that. We cannot fellowship that. Well, and I know when people say um, back in Genesis chapter 12 that God made a covenant. You know, and it's an everlasting covenant with Israel. Well, let, let's think about that for a minute. They say... Uh, there's a land use covenant that God made and, and a land rights covenant that God made. And that the land use covenant was conditional and the land rights covenant was unconditional. Well, I believe they're both one and the same covenant. But they said, well, let's see. It says, I'm going to give you this land for an everlasting covenant. And that must mean it's eternal. Wrong. Now, I want you, to, want you to get an understanding of that. Sometimes that word everlasting does mean eternal. But it does, you cannot say that in every case because the Lord says concerning the priesthood of Aaron that it would be an everlasting priesthood. And concerning the atonement that the high priest was to make every year, that it would be an everlasting atonement. Well, wait a minute. Is the priesthood of Aaron still valid today? Is the atonement still being made today? Absolutely not. So you cannot, you don't have a leg to stand on to say because it says everlasting, it means eternal. I I believe that God was done with Israel in AD 70. And for over 1800 years, uh, they were scattered to the four corners of the earth. And some have the idea that the Lord's going to come back and reestablish uh, Israel and they're going to reinstitute all this. These sacri- they've stated that's what they want to do. That's not a secret. That's not a conspiracy either. So, for the gospel's sake, they're enemies. We can't fellowship them. And, oh, I know people say, they, they quote that text from Genesis 12, those, that, those nations that bless you will be blessed, and those nations that curse you will be cursed. Well, let's do some math for just a minute. Since 1948, one of the staunchest allies of that nation in Palestine over there has been the United States. I don't think... Anybody will deny that. And in foreign aid, I think we're giving them something like $6 billion a year. No greater natural ally to, to the nation of Israel than the United States. So if anybody's blessing Israel, the United States certainly is. But let's see. If I'll bless the nation that blesses thee. So let, let's do the math. When you look around and you see uh, the, the condition that uh, this country's in right now with rampant abortion. Is that a blessing? Uh, 
Or you see that homosexuals want to marry? You think that's a blessing? I mean, do I need to go down the list? Uh, and it's very obvious to see that in many ways this nation is not being blessed. Not being blessed by God. If anything, we're being there's a curse that's coming on this nation because this is a nation of idolatry. And I know people don't like to hear that, but... It's a nation of idolatry because of the materialism and because of the debt that we get ourselves in where we find ourselves. God is not happy with that. And I want to tell you one thing that's something else. You need to study this out on your own. You go back in the Old Testament and you find out that one thing that God did not like, and that's usury. You know what that is? That's charging somebody interest. Now, charging, uh, charging interest on a loan, making a loan and charging interest. And it just so happens that, that we have a banking system uh, that, that's owned by a group of people and boy, they're sticking it to us pretty bad. They are, this nation is in, is in debt to those people. Um, and I'm talking about the Federal Reserve. And by the way, did you know that the Federal Reserve is not a government agency? It is not a government, it is a privately owned bank. And it's named Federal Reserve just to give us the, the impression that it's a government agency. It is not. We are indebted, uh, we are indebted to, that, that, uh, uh, to that bank and the amounts of trillions of dollars. Uh, but anyway, I digress. We, we cannot, I, I don't believe that God will, will set, I don't believe the Lord's ever going to set foot on the earth again. He's, at the resurrection he talks about we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and he tells us where uh, he says in the re resurrection they neither marry or are given in marriage but they're as the angels of God where? in heaven uh, I know that text over in Zechariah 12 it says in that day he'll stand he'll split the Mount of Olives did you know that that's what the teachings of the Lord did when He was here, when He was teaching on the Mount of Olives? He divided the people. He said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. I don't believe the Lord will ever set foot on the earth again. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, when the Apostle Paul is talking about the resurrection, then he says, and then the kingdom will go up. The kingdom goes back up to God who gave it. So at the resurrection, the Lord's not coming down to establish a kingdom. The kingdom's going up. The apostle John saw it coming down. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. You know, that, that's the church. So at the end of time, the church is going, uh, at the resurrection, the church is going back up. And that thousand year reign that people are talking about is talking about right now. The, the idea, John Darby's idea that it's not all going to start. See, see, here's what how Darby uh, uh, did all this. In Luke chapter 4, when the Lord quoted, was in the synagogue and quoted, uh, quoted from Isaiah 61 about the spirit of the, I'm a, uh, the, uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach glad tidings and so on. Because he did not quote, and these be the days of vengeance of our God, they say, oh look, he, he didn't say anything about vengeance, so uh, the prophetic clock must have stopped. And, and then, then comes behind what follows that, the idea of a parenthetical kingdom, or that's what they call it, a parenthetical kingdom, until the prophetic clock starts again at the 70th week of Daniel. You see, they, take the, the, uh, they say, well, the prophetic clock stopped, so that means we can take the 70th week of Daniel and we can just project it you know, all the way to the end of time. Well, that's a bunch of... That's a, that's a mess of, of, of lies. <laughs> Uh, that 70th week was fulfilled with the other 69 and Jesus fulfilled it and by the way uh, John Darby's idea of what's going to happen during, during that 70th week has got the Antichrist and the beast fulfilling the things that the Lord himself did no uh -uh. so because uh, uh, he didn't quote and these be the days of vengeance of our God right then they said whoa the clock must have stopped um, so the vengeance must be reserved till the end of time. But the Lord did quote it about 
close to three years later in Luke 21, 21. And he says, These be the days of vengeance that of all things are written might be fulfilled. So the Lord did quote it. He just didn't quote it during the opening of his ministry. And that's when he opened his ministry is in Luke chapter 4 over there when he read that. And I believe that was on the Day of Atonement, by the way. Uh, so the Lord did quote it. And it, uh, the 70th week of Daniel is not in the future. It was fulfilled with the other uh, 69. Uh, and that's including the great tri the speaking that the, the great tribulation would take place. And it did. Uh, and all those things. Matthew chapter 24. Luke 21. Or, or Luke. Luke 21 and Mark 13 all say, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. We know it was a private conversation that the Lord was having with His disciples and that, that was a generation that He was speaking to. He wasn't speaking to some generation 2,000 years into the future. So, but anyway, um, the ideas of John Darby are not very old. Like I say, John Darby uh, dreamed him up uh, got them from a, a woman that had uh, that had been sick by the name of McDonald, who had a vision of two raptures. Well, the scripture doesn't tell, or, or two resurrections. The scripture very plainly tells us that in John chapter five, uh, the hour is coming in the which that are all that are in the grave shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. There are, the, the resurrection is not divided by a thousand years. And that's one of the things that they say in this, you know, some will be resurrected at the first of the thousand year reign, some at the end. Well, I'm going to back up and tell you, I believe that we're in that thousand year reign now. That, that year thousand means for all time. Uh, the scripture says, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. Just a thousand? No. All the cattle on all the hills belong to the Lord. Uh, and there's other ways that you can look at this. But I believe that Jesus is ruling and reigning right now. And the idea that he's not going to begin to rule and reign until at the end of time, you know, I believe and I always believe that that's a diversionary of the enemy. And In other words, I'm looking for that time that I can reign with Christ, but I could be doing it right now. And you can be doing it right now. In the kingdom of God. He says, I prepared you a table that you might eat and drink in my, at, at my table in my kingdom. We can be ruling and reigning with Christ right now. So, and I believe that, and to say that Christ is not reigning, I'm not going to take that position. People, they don't understand when they say Christ is not going to begin to reign until the thousand year reign. He's ruling right now. Let me go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 so I can get that text. And I don't misquote it. Okay, I think I'm close to verse... Maybe verse 53, somewhere around there. Let's see. Maybe a little sooner. Bear with me just a second. Guess I should have looked this up before I get... Okay. Verse... Um, 22. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Now, here he's talking about the Christ at his coming. He says, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when He shall have put down all rule and authority and a power. You see what happens at the resurrection? The Lord's not pick, taking up rule and reign and authority. He's laying it down. Why? He says, for He must reign 
till all enemies are put under his feet. The last enemy that is destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. In other words, Christ is not above God. He says, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also be subject unto him that did put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So at the resurrection, the Lord is not setting up a kingdom. The Lord is laying down all power and rule and authority. And he relinquishes the kingdom to God, and he also subjects himself to God the Father. So, there's a lot of problems with the idea of a uh, future millennial reign. A lot of problems. Uh, a lot of problems with the, you know, the, the idea of the rapture. Now, when I think about the rapture, I think about being uh, the dead coming out of the graves or those that are alive being caught up to meet the Lord of the air. Now, that's the only, well, and there's a text... Oh, they, uh, Tim LaHaye, when he was writing his fiction. By the way, Tim LaHaye tells you that his writings are fiction. We know what fiction is, and it's not true. <laughs> he tells you when he's writing his fiction. Uh, but one of the things that they, the text they take, it says, Two will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Well, that, that's their, part of their doctrine of the rapture. The idea that, you know, there, if you've been Mr. Goody Two-Shoes and you've lived toe the line and, and you've walked a straight and narrow, then the Lord will take you home and the, and the unbeliever will be left here to suffer the tribulation. Well, I, th- I don't think that's what that's talking about. I think that's talking about the, the Roman army. Every army that con- ever conquered any other city or nation or country, one of the things that they did is they took booty, they took plunder, uh, and they took the we. Uh, they took the strong, and they made them slaves. Josephus tells us that there were ninety thousand people that were taken slaves after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, that were taken captive. Um, so now, does this? I, I just can't draw from that. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left means that one's taken to heaven and the other's not. I just don't draw that. I, I can't draw that from there. Uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't equate. So, will there be uh, uh, a seven year period of tribulation? Uh, and people have different ideas about Darby's scheme saying some will be taken pre trib. Some will be taken mid-tribulation. Some will be taken post-tribulation. Well, first of all, I've, I've told you that the 70th week is not separated from the other 69, uh, and that the great, the great tribulation has already taken place. I believe that you want to look at at the uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. It describes it. It describes it in great detail, uh, and the. Uh, the um, what God said He would do to Israel, and I believe that the Lord divorced the nation of Israel, and that He's married to the church. So, anyway, um, I, I find a hard time trying to support Jews that are openly anti-Christ. I didn't say that I hated them. I just can't fellowship. You know, there's a lot of people, even in in uh, Christendom or what we call other Christian denominations, I don't hate them, but I just can't fellowship them. Uh, not until the time that comes that we're resurrected and we're all made in the image and the likeness of Christ, and then we stand before God in sinless perfection, then I can. But now, I'm told to not, to not have fellowship with them and, and to avoid those that teach things that are not according to this word. And that's the same thing with the Antichrist. You don't want to have fellowship with the Antichrist, do you? Huh. So, and then there's this business of uh, in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. Those that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Where are those people? They claim to be Jews, but they're not. But they're of the synagogue of Satan. Now, 
Remember this. Remember what the, the enemy is able to transform himself into an angel of light. You remember that? I think that he's still able to do that today. He can, he can present himself as an angel of light. And those of the synagogue of Satan, uh, we don't want to fellowship them either, do we? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But I believe that they're out there. Now, if I started trying to pinpoint for you who I thought they were, I'd get a lot of people. A lot of people would get mad at me. So I'm not going to do it. I want people to do their own study and come to their own conclusions and read the Word of God for themselves. Uh, so you've got the synagogue of Satan, which uh, talks about fake Jews. And the Scripture tells you who the true Jews are. And the Scripture tells you that the national Israel, that they're enemies for the gospel's sake. And we can't, we're not to fellowship. It doesn't mean we're to hate them. I don't, they're just as elect as any, anybody else of the elect are. They're just as elect. But for right now, for our sakes, he says, that's, that's so the gospel can be spread to the Gentiles. Uh, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become and so on. <clears throat> they're, they're out there. And the devil is the father of lies. And the Lord told the Pharisees, said, you are of your father the devil. Now, I can't say that to anybody because I don't know. I can't see the hearts of men. But the Lord knoweth them that are his. And if the Lord knows them that are his, then he's got to know those that aren't his. Right? Uh, he could say to those, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. By the way, wh what is that about? Matthew chapter 7. Think about this for a minute. Lord, Lord, we've done many wonderful works in your name. We've cast out devils and done all this, all this wonderful stuff in your name. And he said, said to him, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Those are some people that were trying to work their way uh, into God's favor and, and to by their own works of righteousness to find standing with God. And they weren't trusting uh, in, in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody that tries to work, it's a work of iniquity to not believe that Jesus finished the work that God gave him to do. It's iniquity. Um, it makes me think of one of the things that when we talk about, I want to digress for just a little bit. When we talk about the reason that we sing a cappella. Well, you know, people say all the time, the Old Testament is just chock full of musical instruments. It is. Psalm 150, an entire chapter. Well, over there in the Old Testament, when they were offering the sacrifices, except they said that the, the trumpets were to sound until the sacrifice was finished. Uh, the, mus the musical instruments would play until the sacrifice was finished. Then after the sacrifice was finished, then they praised God with the words of David. That right there is an indication to me that there was a change in the order of the service. So the sacrifice is complete. We don't use musical instruments. We praise God with the words of David and with the word of God. And we sing and make melody in our heart uh, to the Lord. And we sing with grace in our hearts. And one of the things that I know, you look in the book of Amos chapters 5 and 6. There are some stern warnings over there about how God feels about musical instruments. And, and God was not pleased that made musical instruments to themselves like David did. No, the Lord wasn't pleased with that. So, but anyway, those were, anti, those were uh, types and shadows. Those musical instruments were types and shadows of that which was to come in the New Testament uh, era, and that's to sing inwardly. The law was outward, grace is inward. Law, uh, types and shadows, outward. The anti-type uh, is inward. So, and Christ is ruling and reigning today. And he's, where, where is he reigning exactly? <clears throat> well, he told some people on one occasion, he said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. For lo, the kingdom of God is within you. Is the kingdom of God in here? 
Is not your body the temple of the Holy Spirit? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you're not your own, you're bought, you're paid with a price? Our bodies are the temple of God. And, and the Lord resides in, his, in our hearts, in His temple, and He sits and He rules and He reigns. Remember that we need to be looking where God's looking. Where is God looking? When He looks at you, where does He look? Does He look here? He's looking at your heart, isn't He? That's what he said when he was choosing a, king, uh, uh, choosing a king for Israel after Saul had fallen. Well, before actually, while Saul was, uh, David was chosen before Saul was out, um, out of the kingship. But he told, all of David's brothers came through and the Lord says, I've not chosen any of these. Are there any more? And then David was out in the field feeding the sheep and he came in and he says, this is the one. He said, look not on his outward appearance, for God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So the Lord looks on the heart, and we need to be looking where the Lord's looking. And when the Lord looks at our heart, what does He see? What does the Lord see when He looks at us and when He looks at our heart? So I suggest to you that we also need to be looking. I'm not talking about the the heart that's rejected, uh, the heart of depravity. I'm talking about that new heart that he says he'll take out the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And he'll write his laws in our hearts and our minds. And he'll be to us a God and we shall be to him a people. I'm talking about that new heart according to Ezekiel 36. When we're born of the Spirit of God that He puts in there. I'm talking about not necessarily that, that muscle that pumps blood. I'm talking about the seat and the core of our affections and our, and our desires. We need to look there and, and see what it is. What are our desires? What are our affections? Have we set our affections on things above and not on things of the earth? What's in our heart? What does the Lord see? Because He's ruling and reigning. And sometimes we let other, other, I'm going to just say junk. We let other junk in and it pushes them out. Then he said, if any man love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, that's, a lot of people don't like that. They don't like that text. <clears throat> but anyway, the Lord's reigning and ruling now. And the idea that he's not going to begin to rule and reign. I've showed you from 1 Corinthians 15 at the end the kingdom goes up at the resurrection at the re one resurrection not two now there well two bodily there's not two bodily resurrections there are two resurrections <laughs> we're born of the spirit when we're born of the spirit of god that's a resurrection from death and trespasses and sins to a life in christ but there's only going to be one bodily resurrection at the end not to be mistaken with the resurrection of the first fruits. Okay, I know this this um, can get a little bit complicated, but there was a resurrection that took place after Christ came out of the grave. He says in in Matthew 28, he says that many of the bodies of the saints which slept came out of the grave. Now, what does he say? The rocks were rent, the graves were open. And many of the bodies of the saints which slept came out of the grave after his resurrection and appeared unto many in the holy city. That was a resurrection of the first fruits, and that happened on the day of first fruits. Okay, uh, when when the Lord cried with a loud voice, uh, those graves were opened up, ready for those people to come out after the Lord came out of the grave, sometime after sundown on Saturday. So th that was a resurrection, and that's probably the resurrection that Hymenaeus and Philetus were teaching, saying the resurrection was past. Because there were many witnesses that saw those people. Uh, and the idea is that there were 12,000 from each tribe, or the 144,000 uh, you read about in the book of Revelation, the first fruits unto God uh, from the dead, and so on. But so there was that resurrection, and then we, we expect a general resurrection at the very end of time both the just and the unjust coming out at the same time. And the Lord's ruling and reigning now. That's one of the main, uh, one of the main points that I want to try to make this morning and that uh, He reigns in our hearts and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ daily. You know, uh, to give an account. 
But have you have you ever experienced that? Have you ever had to give an account to the Lord by some, because of something that you did? I know I have. And I know that I've been judged. But uh, that beam of the uh, judgment seat or that beam of seat or whatever uh, the, they call it, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We, we do every day. And because that He rules and He reigns in our hearts, uh, God, God is a spirit and our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, He's taken up residence. That, if, if that doesn't make an impression on a person to think soberly, I mean to really think hard, long and hard about how it is that we live and the things that we think uh, the scripture teaches us that we're to cast down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God because the Lord knows what you're thinking. I mean, he's, he's, uh, He knows your thoughts are far off. If He's living in you, He knows everything that you think. And you know what? Uh, I still struggle sometimes, but there was a time that I just let all kinds of filth run right through, that, through my mind all day long all day long and I didn't realize but I, and I've given you examples of uh, how the Lord has manifest uh, the secrets of my heart the, the things that I thought about during the week or uh, whatever and they were manifest in the preaching of the gospel and proved to me without a doubt that God knows what I'm thinking I better start cleaning up my thoughts we all need to clean up our thoughts We've all we've all got that uh, two dogs, you know, the two dogs in the fight, right? Now, the flesh against the spirit, and the two are contrary to one another. We've got that warfare that we fight, but we need to clean up, clean up our thoughts, and be careful what we let come in. And you have authority uh, to resist Satan. He says, "You resist the devil, he'll flee." But you know what? If you don't resist him, he's not going to run. If you don't resist, it's just like inviting him in. Come on in. Have a seat. Have a cold one. <laughs> right? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> That's not good. Not good. So we, we learned to, because of the fact that Christ is ruling and reigning in our hearts, uh, uh, we begin to clean up our thoughts and we guard our minds. Now, I didn't say close your minds. We guard our minds. And we better know to guard it with the Scripture, with the Word of God. So, um, yes, the Lord is ruling and He's reigning now in the hearts of His people. And I feel, I feel bad for those that, that think, well, the Lord's not going to begin to reign until that prophetic clock starts again. Did you, do you realize, too, that when people that think that the prophetic clock stopped and the Lord failed and converting, you know, they think that he failed in converting the Jews. So he's he's put a spare tire on, which is the church. He'll just I'll just throw a spare on this thing until I get to and I'll have another chance. Well, I don't think that God is working on the basis of chance. Uh, he works on the basis of getting things done. But I'll just that they say, uh, well, it's like the Lord, you know, he, he failed converting the Jews and the, the prophetic clock is stopped and I'll just throw a spare tire on and I'll call it the church and I'll have another opportunity when I reestablish the, uh, the nation of Israel at the end of time. Now, I, don't, I don't believe that's going to happen. I don't believe it's going to happen. And what we've got going on over there now that came about in 1948, uh, now here's the thing. This week I've been called a Jew hater, an anti-Semite, and a couple of other things. You know, if that's what they... Here's the thing. There are two sides to every story. And did you know the story I've heard all my life, I believed up until just a couple of years ago. There are two sides. Now, and when you've got some people... Um, well, some people say, and I, I, I'm not trying to, here, here's the thing, I'm not preaching the gospel to please men. I'm not preaching the gospel to please you. I preach the gospel, I'm entrusted with the gospel to please the Lord. 
And here's a side of history that you're never told. Is that mainly those, those people that came into Palestine in 1948 were granted nation status by the UN on the grounds of sympathy because of the Holocaust. And you only hear one side of that story because the fact of the matter is that all of our news media are controlled by Zionists. Not making it up. Not a conspiracy. It's a fact. You can go check it for yourself. And when the people that are in charge are controlling the media, you're only going to hear one side. But I pray that every one of God's people would look at this, this stuff that John Darby and, and uh, Cyrus Ingersoll Schofield, it's his name, C.I. Schofield. You know, he had in his Bibles, um, I guess it's sort of like, this is not a Schofield Bible, but it's sort of like this one. You'll see that the scripture goes from here to here. And by the way, I never use this stuff down here. But I got a good deal on this Bible when I bought it. It's the King James. It's Cambridge. Uh, but there's notes down here. And, and on some pages of just like that, look how much scripture's here and how much notes are here. Well, Schofield took all of John Darby's ideas and filled the pages of the Bible with them. And then people started reading that stuff and, and started believing it. But it's new doctrine. It's new. It came about in the period of what's called as the Second Great Awakening. And you want to look at all the stuff that arose over there, you go look and there's a bunch of stuff that came up. I'm talking about Millerism, Seventh-day Adventism, Pentecostalism, Mormonism, and it goes on and all these isms go on and on and on. That was a time then where there was a lot of kooky stuff. People were getting the idea, well, God failed. You know, look at the church. Look at the old Baptist church. Well, we don't like it. God pretty much failed. we got to start over. And all these people would come up and say, we pretty much got to start over. Well, that's, that's where they were wrong. The Lord has, has had a witness and will have His church will be in the world throughout all ages without end. Uh, but no, the church doesn't have to be done over, uh, um, restarted. God has always had a, a remnant, according to the election of grace, I believe, that maintained the truth, that earnestly contended for the faith once delivered to the saints, and that have, uh, that have held the truth, and that have preached the truth, and to maintain the simplicity that's in Christ. I believe that God has always had the church ever since He established it. I don't believe that it died out or got so far off track that some, some you'll have to bring in some new ideas and we'll have to restart it. And that's what a lot of this stuff during the Second Great Awakening, a lot of men had that idea. Well, we just got to start it all over. And they were bringing in new doctrines. Well, there's nothing to be added to the Word of God. <clears throat> you study for yourself and you see all the new doctrines that arose during that Second Great Awakening uh, and you'll find that they're, they're new. They're not in here. They're not in this book. And the Lord says that the revelation is complete. There's nothing to be added to or taken away. And you don't, you don't diminish aught from God's Word is what He told Moses. No, nope. this revelation is complete. There's nothing to be added to it. Um, so, but anyway, I, I may get in trouble with some people that say, well, then I'm a Jew hater. I'm not a Jew hater. I don't hate I don't hate anybody. God knows God knows my heart. Not a not an anti Semite. But see that's how they that's how they uh, you wanna know who's in control. You wanna know who's in control, you find out who you can't criticize. That's what Voltaire said. You wanna know who's in control, you find out who you're not allowed to criticize. Then you'll know who's in control. Well you know we're not allowed to criticize the Jews. Uh, or the Zionists. Do you know the Zionists have all the money in the Federal Reserve? They own all the media and they own Hollywood. And you wonder why the... <laughs> then it was sometime maybe we need to talk about the, Bolshe the Bolshevik Revolution. 
that took place in 1917 and led to the rise of communism in Russia. And, and you read about the 60 million plus that died over there and there were some people that behind it. They don't want you to know that they were behind all that. Guess who it was? See, that's the other side. That's the other side of the story. That's the one that you don't hear in the mainstream media. And uh, Hitler had to fight off that communism in, in his country. And Hitler was fighting off the establishment of a central bank. Did you realize that in the, uh, in, in the year 2000 there were like 11 countries that didn't, did not have a Rothschild bank in it? And today there's only been like three. And in the year 2000, Afghanistan and Iraq did not have a central bank. And guess what happened after 9-11? We all said, well, we need to go to war with them folks. And guess what now? They've got a bank. Surprise, surprise. You know the three nations that don't have a, a, a Rothschild central bank right now? Korea, North Korea, Iran, and Cuba. So who are, who's doing the saber rattling now? And who? Think about this. Who's doing the saber rattling now? Well, it's Iran. They've got nukes. Man, we need to go get them. We need to go. That's what they're saying. That's what John Hagee will tell you. Of this Christian Zionism. You got a bunch of Christians on board with supporting the reestablishing the nation of Israel and, and, and all the stuff they want to do. Well, they'll say, "Well, we love Israel, so we need to go uh, have a preemptive strike on Iran." Oh my gosh, they haven't got it yet. There's there's no real premise for these wars, uh, except to uh, uh, establish a Rothschild central bank. So once that happens, like I say, there's only three countries left. And by the way, our president just visited Cuba not too long ago. A couple weeks ago. For the first time in a long, long time before Kennedy. What's up with that? Maybe a bank fell out of his pocket while he was over there. I don't know. <laughs> well, anyway... That's a conspiracy, and I'm gonna see people think we're gonna label me a, a conspiracy nut. I, that's okay. I don't care. I don't care. Uh, but I believe that if you'll study these things out, you'll find it out for yourself. It's it's glaring now. They don't care if we know. They don't care that we know because they have all the money. They've got all the power. They've got all of our the, most of our politicians in their pocket. I'm not gonna say all. Just like all mechanics are not crooks, right? <laughs> all plumbers are not crooks. There's some honest plumbers. There's some honest mechanics, and there's some honest politicians. But by and large, <laughs> APAC and the uh, Anti-Defamation League and uh, ACLU and um, all these people, they've got lots of power in our political system. Now, I, I, I've... Uh, said a few years ago I would never get into politics but I guess I've changed my mind uh, we just need to be aware we need to open our eyes so we're not taken captive by the enemy I don't believe anything that I hear on the news media anymore unless it talks about there was a car wreck and I can see that yep there's a car wreck or there's a fire but all this international news and something happened over in Ten Buck Two. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I don't know. We've got to be very careful because um, our enemy is very powerful. And uh, he says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them, but believe not. Now, God with a little g, that's talking about Satan. He's blinded some people. I hope that's not us. I just hope that's not us. Thank you all for your good attention. Uh, if you're going to stone me, wait and give me about a two-minute head start. <laughs> and uh, I love you all. The Lord knows. Uh, some of this stuff is probably something you've never heard. You may not believe it, and you're welcome to not believe it. But I, I pray that, uh, that you study these things for yourselves to see whether they be so. As we stand and sing a suitable hymn, one or more has a desire to unite with this body, this would be your opportunity. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas.
Services begin at 10.30 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.